Hi boys and girls, Mrs. Sadowski here, and it's time for another chapter of By the Great Horn Spoon. Now, we know Jack has formed quite the bond with Good Luck the pig, right? And in the last chapter, he kept telling Good Luck, go away, go away. You're going to be Sunday dinner soon. Stop eating so much. You're getting too fat. The cook's going to want to cook you. Well, that all comes into play today because chapter four is the pig hunt. Ready, boys and girls? Let's see what happens. Once I get the audio going, of course. Here we go. Four. The Pig Hunt. Jack began to dread Sunday dinners. It was bound to be good luck's turn on the menu soon. The pig no no longer came trotting after him, it was true, for Jack had tied up the pen to make it escape-proof. But the porker remained on his mind, if not at his heels. And then, with Rio de Janeiro only a few days away, Jack saw the cook leave the galley with a heavy meat cleaver in his hand. Good grief! thought Jack. He's gone for good luck! Without a second thought, Jack went sliding down the nearest ladder. When the cook arrived at the animal pens, the porker was gone, and so was Jack. It's that boy, he shouted, waving the meat cleaver. Pigs are for eating, not for pets. Soon, even the gold seekers joined in the pig hunt, for the promise of fresh pork made their mouths water. They looked above decks and below decks. They glanced up masts and down ventilators. The cook himself went searching through the cargo hold, where Monsieur Gaunt, a Frenchman in the rough homespuns of a farmer, was watering his precious grape cuttings. Have you seen a pig down here? growled the cook. No, Monsieur. But rats? Oui. The chase continued. The pig hunters looked everywhere but the captain's stateroom, which was fortunate, for Jack and Good Luck were hiding behind the open door. Not a sound out of you, Jack whispered. The pig, snorting out of sheer love, rubbed his ever-fattening side against Jack's leg. Shh! Just then, the captain himself could be heard approaching along the passageway. But when he entered his cabin, there was no sign of pig or boy. He hung up his blue cap, yawned, and took a nap. When he was sound asleep, Jack and Good Luck crept out from under the bunk, where there was hardly room to breathe. Jack looked around, wondering what to do next. It seemed hopeless, but he wasn't going to deliver up the porker to the cook without a battle. Leaning his bristled back against Jack's leg, the pig grunted a loud word of endearment and almost woke the captain. Jack's breath caught. Then he poured in a storm, he told himself, and ran. He made a beeline toward his own cabin with good luck trotting along behind. At that moment, Mountain Jim happened along the passageway, and the pig went through his bowed legs. If many gold seekers had joined in the hunt, others considered it sport to outwit the cook. Mountain Jim merely turned to give Jack a wink and went on his way. Once in his cabin, Jack stopped short. Dr. Buckby was stretched out for a nap and snoring loudly. Moving on his toes, Jack approached his hammock. He would wrap good luck in a blanket and hide him in the hammock. But when Jack turned, his breath caught again. The porker had his two front hooves on Dr. Buckby's bunk and had leaned his head closer to see what all the snoring was about. The horse doctor awoke. He found himself staring into a strange grunting face. Thinking he was being set upon by map robbers, for he was more asleep than awake, he began to blow on his tin alarm trumpet. Jack was horrified. The trumpeting sounded like a sick elephant. It would bring the entire ship. It's only us, Dr. Buckby, Jack cried, but he couldn't be heard over the blare of the horn. There was no way out of the cabin but the door, and it was too late for that. Quickly, Jack got his arms around good luck, climbed on a sea chest, and tried to stuff the porker through the brass porthole. But good luck got stuck half 
in and half out. Jack put his shoulder to the job, but it was no use. You're done for now! Praiseworthy, hearing the alarm trumpet, was first in the cabin. What's this? he said, sizing up the situation quickly. A pig in a porthole? Have you seen a cook? asked Jack desperately. He was still pushing against the pig's fat rump. A few paces behind, said Praiseworthy, opening his black umbrella. Step aside, Master Jack. When the cook entered, together with several gold seekers, there was no pig to be seen. Praiseworthy had taken up a position directly in front of the porthole with his umbrella blocking the view. By then, Dr. Buckby had stopped trumpeting. Robbers, he said, trying to get my map. I almost caught one of them, a big fellow with fat cheeks. A mere dream, said Praiseworthy. The cook raised his meat cleaver again. There's the boy. Where's my pig? Pig? What pig? He's got it. And Praiseworthy turned to Jack. Pig? Pig? Master Jack, do turn your pockets inside out. Our chef seems to think you have a pig about you. The gold seekers began to laugh. There's no robber in here. <laughs> or pig either. Come on, boys. But the cook turned at the door, squinting at Praiseworthy. It's none of my business, he said, crossing his fat arms. But do you even stand under that umbrella? Indoors? This cabin leaks shamefully. But it ain't raining. One can never be too careful in these latitudes. Good day, sir. The cook left, shaking his head, and praiseworthy folded the umbrella. When Jack glanced back at the porthole, his eyebrows jumped an inch. The pig had vanished. Look! He's, he's gone! I declare, said praiseworthy in genuine surprise. Jack stuck his head through the porthole and looked around. There wasn't a soul in sight or a pig either. Jack left the cabin and ran out on deck, where he found Mountain Jim seated on an overturned barrel and playing Oh Susanna on a mouth organ. Have you seen a black pig, sir? asked Jack, out of breath. Seen him? The mountain man grinned. Why, boy, I'm sitting on it. And he tapped the side of the barrel with his harmonica. Jack wiped the sweat off his forehead and began to smile. Thank you, Mountain Jim, sir. The porter was safe, at least for the time being. I thought I'd need bear grease to get him out of that porthole. Sit down, Jack boy, and we'll do a bit of singing to pass the time. I'll learn you how to trap a grizzly. A boy your age needs all the educating he can get. Jack seated himself beside the mountain man on the top of the barrel. Soon he was singing to the windy accompaniment of the mouth organ, drowning out any snorts or grunts of protests from the pig. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. I'm going to California with my wash bowl on my knee. Okay, I'm going to pause right there. Do you guys all understand what a mouth organ is? He mentions mouth organ here and as well on this page. And then a little bit long, uh, farther down, he mentions uh, the harmonica. If you've never seen a harmonica, they're a little metal instrument, not this big, and you blow on it. And depending on where you blow on it and what parts of it you cover, you get different sounds. So it's the instrument that you hear in the background for the music that's playing when they're singing. Now, if you don't know what a porthole is, behind me here, let me turn my camera a little bit. I've drawn on my whiteboard, oops, I went the wrong direction. Okay, so right here on my whiteboard, and hang in there while my little visualizer needs to reconnect, um, I have a picture of a ship in the water, and don't laugh at my drawings, I'm not the best artist. But these round circles, these would be like the windows on a ship, they're round, and they call them portholes, they don't call them windows. And so they had to actually try to hide the pig halfway in one of those portholes. That's why if you're holding an umbrella, it could block it. So you have some that tend to be outside the ship where it would just be the ocean if it dropped. But then you have other portholes where there's a deck where people could be walking by. And those portholes would be where the pig came out. And then Mountain Jim must have been out there to grab the pig and hide him. Okay? So I just wanted to make sure that you guys understood that part. All right, here we go. 
When the cook passed, Mountain Jim lifted his yellow bobcat cap with one big hand and went on playing the harmonica with the other. After dinner, and well after dark, Jack returned for the pig. A few feet away stood the small stern boat with a canvas thrown over it. He waited until the afterdeck was clear of passengers. Then he lifted the barrel, gave the porker a hug, and shoved him up over the gunwale of the boat. Done, he said, straightening out the canvas. He supposed this cat-and-mouse game of cook and pig was doomed, but he wasn't giving up. Good night, good luck. The pig replied with a snort of true love and began scratching his back on the underside of the boat seat. Sunday passed without roast pork for dinner, and the following night, the Lady Wilma anchored off the green coast of Brazil. With the coming of dawn, the sidewheeler entered the channel and passed under the fortress guns of Rio de Janeiro. Praiseworthy and Jack stood on the forecastle with a warm breeze snapping their trousers. It seemed to Jack that he had almost forgotten what land looked like. The mere sight of a hill or distant tree excited him. And then the sunny harbor came into view, with church bells ringing out across the water. House windows reflected the dazzling morning sun. Homesick, Master Jack? asked Praiseworthy in a quiet voice. Jack looked up. I wish Aunt Arabella and Constance and Sarah were with us. But of course, the good country is no place for women and children. It's not too late to change your mind, Master Jack. Change my mind? The butler rubbed the tip of his sharp nose and looked down into Jack's eyes. Cape Horn lies ahead of us. It's a bad stretch of water. Very bad indeed, the captain tells me. The wind comes howling in like banshees, and the waves can batter a ship to splinters. No one will think the less of you, Master Jack, if you leave the Lady Wilma here at Rio. We'll manage to get you a passage back to Boston. Jack turned away from Praiseworthy's gaze and tightened his eyes against the breeze. He felt a welling up inside him. Didn't Praiseworthy want him along any longer? I'm not scared, he answered finally. The thought hadn't crossed my mind. You said we were partners. We are indeed. But I could never forgive myself if... Do you think we'll get smashed to splinters? The Lady Wilma's a stout ship. Do you think Captain Swain's a good master? None better. Jack looked back up into the butler's eyes. Go home. How could he go home without his pockets full of gold nuggets? Then I'm going on to California. I'm not turning back, no sir. He wiped his nose. But if you don't want me for a partner anymore, why I'll... Don't talk nonsense, interrupted Praiseworthy with a sudden smile as bright as the morning. You said exactly what I thought you would, but I had to be sure. You'll do, Master Jack. You'll do. He put a hand on the boy's shoulder, and Jack looked up. He could feel the reassuring grip of Praiseworthy's fingers. The butler winked. Jack smiled and wiped his nose again. Above them, in the pilot house, Captain Swain was looking for the Sea Raven among the ships at anchor. Their masts were as thick as reeds in a pond. Many were gold ships, like the Lady Wilma herself, pausing to take on fresh water and supplies. When the customs boat came alongside, Captain Swain shouted down, Is the Sea Raven in port, sir? No, Captain! She left us five days ago. The ship's master greeted this news with his familiar roar. Blast! Well, we won't tarry. By grabs, we'll sail tomorrow with the outgoing tide. While the Lady Wilma took on coal and fresh provisions, the gold seekers invaded the city. There were Americans everywhere. Jack posted his letter. If he had found his sea legs, he had lost his land legs. The cobbled streets of Rio seemed to pitch and roll under him. Praiseworthy had to use his umbrella as a cane until the city stopped heaving about. Throughout the day, ships could be seen arriving and departing. Old friends from New Bedford or Salem or Concord 
met on streets thousands of miles from home. That night, when Praiseworthy and Jack returned to their ship, their arms were loaded with exotic fruits never seen at home in Boston. Bananas and pineapples and guavas. When they awoke the next morning, the Lady Wilma was already setting a sea course with the outgoing tide. Jack stood at the cabin porthole and watched the city slip away, holding up its windows like mirrors to the pink dawn sky. After breakfast, Jack started for the stern boat with table scraps for good luck. Suddenly, he heard the blare of Dr. Buckby's alarm trumpet. A moment later, the horse doctor appeared from a passageway with the trumpet at his lips and his cheeks swelled out like apples. The noise brought passengers from every direction. It's stolen! Dr. Buckby wailed, pausing for breath. Gone! What's this? said Praiseworthy, interrupting a stroll around deck. What's gone? My coal map! I'm ruined! The horse doctor gave a final wail on the trumpet. My brother, rest his bones, posted it to me as he lay dying in California. And now it's been stolen. Gone! Cut eye Higgins, said Mountain Jim. But almost at once, it was discovered that Cut Eye Higgins, too, was gone. He had been forgotten in the haste of coaling and watering the ship. And when Jack reached the after deck, he found that good luck, too, was missing. Even the small stern boat was there no more. All that remained was the canvas shaped over two empty boxes and a cake. The scoundrel! Captain Swain stormed. He must have lit out the night we lay off Rio, waiting to enter the channel. Rode himself ashore. Turn back! Commanded Dr. Buckby, waving his tin trumpet and going around in a circle on his peg leg. Impossible, answered the ship's master unhappily. Then I'm ruined, sir! Ruined! Nonsense. I dare say there's more than one gold mine in California. You may be the first man among us to strike it rich. Jack said nothing about the pig. In the darkness and hurry of his escape, Cut Eye Higgins must not have realized he had a curly-tailed companion aboard the boat. Jack was sorry about Dr. Buckby and his treasure map, but he was pleased with good luck's good luck. The thief had no doubt beached the pig with the boat. Jack watched the green coast of Brazil slip further away and even smiled to himself. The porter was forever safe from the cook. Alrighty, boys and girls. So, we find out that yes, good luck is really pretty lucky, right? After all, he managed to be hidden very well from the... Um, from all the men on the boat looking for him. And he also managed to get off the ship and not slaughtered for dinner. And who knows, maybe he'll have a great life in Rio de Janeiro. Now notice, this is the first time that they've stopped since they set out on this journey. So we've talked a little bit about the map and I'll bring the map back over. Now Rio de Janeiro in Brazil is gonna be you know, down here. So they've traveled all the way down here. And they aren't going to be stopping again until they get up over here. So kind of keep that in mind, you know, these big chunks that they have to travel on this boat. And they're on there a long time. And you're out at sea and, you know, you've got the waves and sometimes the waves are gentle. And sometimes the waves are pretty brutal, right? And they can tip you sideways and then bring you back. So any of you ever gone to the beach and spent like the whole day at the beach and out in the water? And then later that night, when you're in bed, lying there and you close your eyes, it kind of feels like you're moving a little bit. Okay, if that's never happened to you, it means you haven't spent enough time on the water. I promise, if you spend enough time on the water, you will have that experience. So if you've ever been on a boat for a long period of time or spent a lot of time in the water floating and things like that, then when you're really still and you try to walk on dry land, it it's weird. You, your body still thinks it's supposed to be moving, and then you have a hard time walking on the flat surface. And that's what they meant about they had just gotten used to their sea legs, and now they've forgotten their land legs. Didn't mean they switched their legs out. 
So let's talk about this chapter. After all, we know that when we're working with our um, By the Great Horn Spoon, we are going to be focusing on our summary skills, identifying those key events that happen in the story. And this is the week, boys and girls, that I'm modeling these for you, for Mr. Ford and Mrs. Jensen as well. We would do this typically in class where we'd model a few for you and then the rest are gonna be on your own. So enjoy the fact that we have another one to model. So let's think, hmm, we've got to type our summary. What was key? What was this about? Obviously it's titled The Pig Hunt. So probably the pig should be mentioned. Who's hunting for the pig? Why are they hunting for the pig? We all think we know overall what this is about? I think so. In chapter four, Jack hides good luck from the cook. I think that pretty much sums it up. We can start with a simple sentence like that. Um, for her, Jack knew that the cook wanted the pig for Sunday's dinner. He first hid the pig. Do you guys remember where he first hid the pig? Look back if you're not sure. Captain Swain was there. Do you remember? Captain Swain goes to take a nap. So under Captain Swain's bed. He then takes Good luck to his own cabin. And I won't say good luck again. And the pig accidentally startles her Buckby, who was taking a nap. You'll notice people take naps on ships. It helps pass some of the time. All right, so. Dr. Buckby was taking a nap. Jack frantically tries to shove good luck through a porthole so he can kiss the cabin, but the pig gets stuck. Luckily, Praiseworthy comes in and helps hide good luck's backside with his, not this, with his open umbrella. All right. Um, once everyone sees that all is well and there is no pig in the cabin, they leave. Jack discovers that good luck is now missing. Oh, I may have too many words in this. We may have to cut some of this out. Let's see. We've got to get out of singing with, yeah, I think I have too many. What is not an essential detail here, boys and girls, because this is getting really long. So maybe I'm going to back up. And this might happen to you when you're typing too, because all the key details should fit in this box. So hides good luck from the cook. Maybe we don't really need this part because Jack knew that it was coming. So let's get rid of that sentence. We first did the pig under Captain Swain's bed. He then takes good luck to his own cabin and the pig accidentally startles Dr. Buckby who was taking a nap. Jack frantically tried to shove good luck through a porthole so he could 
Um, I think we can get rid of this so part. I think that's implied, right? So Jack frantically tried to shove good luck through a porthole, but the pig gets stuck. Luckily, Praiseworthy comes in and helps hide good luck's backside with his open umbrella. I think I'll say once everyone is gone, they notice that good luck is no longer in the portfolio. Portfolio. Um, back finds mountain gym hiding the pig under a barrel. And the two sing songs to pass the time. Back finally hid pig in the stern boat and cut I Higgins escaped and took the pig with him. Let's see if I can move this. Maybe if I go up a little bit, can I squeeze a little more into my summary? Because if I can't fit it on this page, I don't get to have it, right? That's the rule. So, let's see. Jack finally had the pig in the stern boat. Kai Higgins escaped and took the pig, I'm going to say accidentally, accidentally took the pig with, oops, with him, Rio de, I'm just going to say to Rio de, I was going to try to type Rio de Janeiro. I want to make sure I spell Rio de Janeiro correctly because right now I'm having a little brain hiccup and I'm forgetting my words. So sorry about this. I know I'm normally a little more on top of it, but where does it say Rio? Or maybe I could just say Rio. I do think it would be better to say Rio de Janeiro. So what embarrassed boys and girls that I cannot think of my spelling here. But this will happen to you too sometimes, where you're looking and trying to find what you want to spell. And don't give up trying to spell it correctly. You can find it somewhere. So I'm looking... must be farther back. I thought I knew exactly where it was, but I am not seeing it still. This is where a little bit, aha, there it is. Okay, now I don't want to lose my page. Rio de, and it is spaced, okay. It's like Jane I E. E R O. Okay, there we go. And I'll put a period. All right, so here we go. Always reread your work. In chapter four, Jack hides good luck from the cook. He first hid the pig under Captain Swain's bed. He then takes good luck to his own cabin, and the pig accidentally startles Dr. Buckby, who was taking a nap. Jack frantically tried to shove good luck through a porthole, but the pig gets stuck. I should say got stuck. He got stuck. Luckily, praiseworthy, I switched my verb tense here, came in and helped hide good luck's backside with this open umbrella. Once everyone is gone, they, once everyone was gone, oh wait, I'm just messing up all over the place. Hide, see first hit. Take a look, he first took the pig under the cabin, he then take.
hides the pig. He then takes to his cabin, accidentally startles, frantically tries. The pig gets stuck. You want to make sure your verb agrees with the same tense. If I'm doing present, I need to just keep it present. If I was past, I need to leave it past. So it comes in. I think I might have been mainly right the first time. Comes in and helps hide good luck backside with his open umbrella. Once everyone is gone, they notice that he's no longer in the porthole. Jack finds Mountain Jim hiding the pig under a barrel, and the two sing songs to pass the time. Jack finally hides the pig in the stern boat, and Kadai Higgins escapes and accidentally takes the pig with him to Rio de Janeiro. There we go. That is better. Alrighty, boys and girls. Whew, that took a while. So let's see. Picture. We need to go to insert. We need an image. And we need to search. Lots could take place. We could have people chasing a pig. We could have a man sitting on a barrel. We could have a miner singing with a harmonica. We could have a little lifeboat rowing away from a big, bigger boat, right? Because a stern boat is like a little lifeboat, um, you know, that you'd row with two oars. I think I'm going to go with people chasing a pig and see what comes up. Well, I see pigs. Here I see somebody trying to chase a pig, but there's like trees and they're not really, you know, chasing a pig with trees. So I think I'm going to give up on my people chasing a pig. And instead, maybe I'll do a lifeboat. Mm, wow, these are some fancy lifeboats. Okay, maybe that's not quite going to give me what I want. Maybe I'll call it a stern boat. Well, it's not quite giving me, you know, that's a little bit more, but maybe I want to put Rowboat. Anything look good here? Maybe, maybe not. It can be hard to find what you want. I almost like the pig chasing picture better. Hmm. Well, boys and girls, I'd have you vote, but right now I can't hear your voices. So I'm just going to have to pick a picture, aren't I? So I think I'm going to do, let's try another idea. Gold miner sitting on a barrel. Lady? Nope. So let's try gold miner with harmonica. How about man with harmonica? Let's see, if this gives me any luck. There's somebody. He looks like Santa. <laughs> um, let's go through. Can we see the harmonica right there? Mountain Jim's supposed to look like a big burly guy, right? So. Maybe this guy, if we trim the picture a little bit, maybe? Or should we go with like the Santa looking guy? Or this guy? I want to make sure I can see the harmonica real well. I want it to be like an old, older style picture. And I'm looking. Sorry this is taking so long. All right. We want our mountain gym to look like this or like this. 
Hmm. We'll go with this one. Let's see. Let's make sure. He's got a harmonica. We'll just get rid of the shopping cart. Does it look like he's playing that harmonica? I think so. That should work. So remember, if you want to edit, you right click, you can crop your image, and you want to pull the black line in. Okay, and you'll know because the original picture will still be there. So I'm going to pull this line in to about there. And I think that will help click off the picture and your edits will be saved. Then in the corner, I can make it smaller, drag it over. And there we go. There's my mountain gym playing the harmonica. Alrighty. So we've done our chapter four. Yay! Sorry it took so long. Next up is chapter five, Land of Fire. So boys and girls, don't forget when you X out of here and you go back to the original, click on chapter five, listen to it carefully, read along in your books, and be thinking, what is this chapter all about? What are those key events? Once you start typing, if you find you've got too much stuff, it's filling up too much room, go back and ask yourself, just like I had to do. I had to cut some things out because I had some things that really eh, weren't so key. All right, good luck, boys and girls.